Zero over zero is not a real number. You've probably learned all your life that zero over zero was undefined. We're going to consider zero over zero now because many functions have what we call a zero over zero form. We call it an indeterminate form because things approaching zero over zero can be approaching any number at all. For example, uh, there's a liar who claims that zero over zero equals four. He can demonstrate to someone that it's plausible that 0 over 0 equals 4. How does he do that? Well, he takes a number, he says, this number is very close to 0, and then he takes another number that he claims is very close to 0, and when he divides them, he gets 4. So you can see that he could manipulate this reasoning to claim that 0 over 0 equals anything. All right, even more persuasive is uh, consider the function x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. Okay, so what's the value of f of 2? If you substitute 2 in, you get a 0 in the numerator and a 0 in the denominator. So this liar can claim, well, f of 2 is equal to 0 over 0. Now let's just figure out what f of 2 is by finding values of f really near 2. So f of 2.01, and he gets numbers very near 4. So in this way, he can claim that 0 over 0 equals 4 but we understand that 0 over 0 could equal anything. The reason that the values of this function near x equals 2 are very close to 4 is that if you factor the numerator, you'll see that there's a, a common factor of x minus 2 in the numerator and denominator. And if you canceled them out, you would get x plus 2. But this equation is not correct as it stands, because on the left side of the equation, we have an expression that's undefined at 2, and on the right side of the equation, we have an expression that is defined at 2. So to make this a correct equation, we would have to put x is not equal to 2. We'd have to restrict the domain on the right side. Now it's a true equation. So the function x squared minus 4 over x minus 2 and the function x plus 2 are the same everywhere except at this one place x equals 2. So if we want to find a limit as x approaches 2 of this function, we could just find the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 2. Okay. Since the limit of x plus 2 is 4, it follows that the limit of f of x is also 4, because these two functions agree everywhere except at 2. And that's how we're going to compute 0 over 0 form limits. If we get a problem like this, then we'll factor out the um, x minus 2's and cancel them. Notice that this statement is true. Even though this statement is false, this statement is true because the limit statement doesn't say anything about what happens at x equals 2. It's only talking about what happens in the neighborhood of 2. So now here's an example of how you will use this idea to compute 0 over 0 form limits. Here's a 0 over 0 form limit. Limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 2x minus 3 over 2x squared minus 7x plus 3. Uh, we have a numerator and a denominator, both of which go to 0 when x goes to 3. So we'll factor them. And when we factor them, we find they both have a factor of x minus 3. And that factor of x minus 3 is what makes it go to 0. So the x minus 3 over x minus 3 is the 0 over 0 problem. We have factored out the 0 over 0 problem, and we can cancel it. And once we cancel it, we can now use the other theorems about limits and just simply substitute 3 for x in this expression. And then we compute it, and we get the answer 4 fifths. So that's the first example. Now let me give you an example with a higher degree polynomial. This example will uh, have a cubic polynomial in it. And you might be alarmed because it's not easy to factor a cubic polynomial. But the good news is you don't have to go through the process of looking for factors. There is a factor that's given to you. We know that since x equals 1 is a 0 of the polynomial, x minus 1 is a factor. All we have to do is uh, to factor out the 0 over 0 problem, we just have to factor out x minus 1. So I'm going to use synthetic division to divide by x minus 1, 
and that's as much work as it takes to factor these polynomials. So my numerator becomes x minus 1 times x squared minus 2x plus 2, and the denominator becomes x minus 1 times x squared plus 5x plus 3 from the result of the synthetic divisions. Then I can cancel out the 0 over 0 problem, and then I can substitute x equals 1 and evaluate, and the answer is 1 ninth. Now when you get an answer to a big complicated limit like this, check it on your calculator. Look at a graph. Uh, if you look at a graph of uh, y equals this rational function, and say you look at it between 0 and 2 on the x-axis, and between uh, 0 and 0 0.2 on the y-axis, you'll see a little hole right over there. That gap uh, is the place where the function is undefined, and if you look at the y-coordinate of that gap, you'll notice that it is about one-ninth. So your calculator can sort of confirm for you that the answer you got seems to be the right answer. Now, this is good for rational expressions when you have a polynomial in the numerator and the denominator, but you, you want to know what to do if you have things that, for example, have an absolute value in them. Like the limit as x approaches 3 from the left, of absolute value of x plus 1 minus absolute value of x minus 3 minus absolute value of x minus 7 over x squared minus x minus 6. All right, students often don't know what to do with the absolute values, so I'm giving you an example that's just loaded with absolute value expressions to show you what to do. It's not that difficult. Now the denominator we don't have to worry about. To get rid of the zero factor in the denominator, I can factor out x minus 3. But to deal with the numerator, we have to somehow get rid of those absolute values. And it's not as difficult as you might think. The reason it's not so difficult is that the limit expression describes what happens in a neighborhood. And if we're talking about the neighborhood that's immediately to the left of 3, the one-sided neighborhood to the left of 3, the places where x is something like 2.999, then we know that the absolute value of x plus 1 is just x plus 1, because something just to the left of 3 plus 1 is a positive number. Num uh, absolute value of x minus 3 is 3 minus x, because numbers like 2.99, when you subtract 3 from them, you get a negative result. And the absolute value of x minus 7 in that neighborhood is equal to 7 minus x, because x minus 7 is a negative number in that neighborhood. So if I replace all of my absolute values with the appropriate replacements, then I get a polynomial over a polynomial, and that can now be factored and the 0 over 0 problem gets factored out and cancelled, and we have 3 over 3 plus 2, which is 3 fifths. Now here's another case where you have the numerator and denominator not quite polynomials. The case where you have binomials involving radicals. So here's a way to deal with that. You might remember that you used to get some advice about how to deal with binomials involving radicals. You were told to multiply by the conjugate to rationalize the denominator. Well, in this case, sometimes you want to turn that advice upside down and rationalize the numerator. So um, if you try that in this case, for example, then you would take the expression and multiply it by square root of x plus 2 over square root of x plus 2. And the numerator becomes x minus 4. In the denominator, I will not multiply out the x minus 4, because I want to keep that factored so I can cancel it. And then I have a 0 over 0 problem I can cancel. And then you might ask, what do I do with the other factor in the denominator? Don't worry about that, because it doesn't go to 0. Just substitute in 4, and it goes to 1 over 2 plus 2. And in order to compute 2 plus 2, you pull out your calculator and you ask it what's 2 plus 2, and you get the answer, and you plug that in. One fourth. So here are some practice problems, uh, just to make sure you can do this on your own. When you get the answers to these practice problems, check to make sure they're plausible using your calculator.